Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 95 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choit. Uh, what's up? If you're new here, what I do is interview people from all walks of life, most often comedians and other artists about their lives and careers. It's casual conversation, but I also ask everyone to highlight someone they love, someone who they admire, who influenced them, inspired them, or supported them. For more, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's peoplewelovepodcast.com. And the Instagram handle is at peoplewelovepodcast. And you can find me on Instagram as well, at Adam Choit, my name, if you want to follow me too. And it's the same on Twitter. And please remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And of course, positive reviews on iTunes are greatly appreciated as well. So today's guest is comedian Gina B. Jones. Born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area, and a quiet, high-achieving kid, it wasn't really until high school and joining theater that she started to come out of her shell. And in college at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, she found her way into a music comedy sketch group, and from there the path to L.A. and eventually into stand-up was forming. But way back when, Gina recalls her family planted a seed, as they always enjoyed watching one particular uber-talented comedian together, the one and only John Mulaney. Let's just get started. Here's Gina B. Jones. So it's good to see you today, uh, Gina Jones. Thank you for uh, joining me on the Zoom. I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Oh, how are you holding up during this a super fun year? Oh, man. To be honest, I started out doing pretty great. I mean, I'm pretty introverted. So when they announced like a lockdown and everyone's like, we're not going to be able to see people, I was totally like unfazed by it um yeah I'm just like generally speaking pretty introverted kind of lazy when it comes to like making plans with people um so I was like honestly living for the first first few months uh because I also had this job that was like letting me work from home but like they didn't really have much for me to do during that time so I was like sweet I don't have to work and I'm getting paid and I'm kind of just hanging out and I don't mind it And then I want to say like starting in like August, September, I was almost, it was just starting to like kind of set in. Like I was like, wow, like stand up is gone. (laughs) Um, I don't feel like I've accomplished that much in this time. And I'm just starting to feel like more ready for this to be over. So (laughs) that's where I'm at now. I think Um, we all are. I think mm -hmm. we all are for sure. Like how, I mean, how hard is it? I mean, I actually haven't talked, I've assumed it's been hard, so I haven't asked every comedian, but like, right. like how hard is it actually to not like be able to like go on stage? I've heard of, you know, some comedians talking about, but from your, how is yeah. it for you? Well, so it's funny because same thing, like kind of at the beginning, like I was really ready for almost a break from stand up because a short break, you know, cause I mean, earlier this year, I was doing sets like all the time. Like it could be like sometimes shows, sometimes open open mics, but I was like, I remember feeling like end of February, I was like so tired. And I was like, I hope I don't have to do any shows in March because I'm just like, I need like to rest for a little bit. Um, But you know, now that's changed. So um, I'm like, it's finally starting to set in like how much I actually miss it. Cause I thought like I'd be unfazed by it, but now I'm just like realizing like all these people that I'm not seeing, um, all these, I just feel genuine, like generally just a little, I, I have like less of a purpose. So that's just, that's yeah. the hard part. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I've gone to a few outdoor socially distant you know whatever shows but there mm-hmm. haven't been very many and now there's pretty much nothing it seems like in LA and you're in you're in you're in DC when did you go from LA uh to DC I mean I'm guessing temporarily yeah. or something yeah pretty much so I came back like right before Thanksgiving I was just kind of like nothing's going on in LA right now or there was like kind of like a short window where um people were doing those outdoor shows like you mentioned and I like almost, I thought about getting into those, but I, I knew that they were going to end like really quickly. <laughs> like I knew that it was going to get cold and or coronavirus is going to surge again. So I was like, uh, it's probably not worth it. It's just so, yeah, hard I mean, to get people. I was just going to say, it's hard to get people to come out to. Yeah, to totally. And yeah, same thing. It's like 
they're cold and <laughs> no one feels safe, you know, so it's like, it's a whole thing. But um, so I decided to come back kind of for the holidays and I was like, why not just stick it out and just stay all the way through. And I save a lot of money when I'm home here because <laughs> I'm not like buying food and stuff. Like I'm here with my parents. So that's You're recharging. Exactly. Re- recharging. I needed like a different moment. I needed like a something to switch it up. We're going to do the end, the end of the interview chronolo- chrono- you know, chronologically. Uh, so mm-hmm. we, we're, at, you, we're where you are <laughs> now. Uh, right. Have you, have you, have you uh, yeah, because I wonder how have you been like writing new, new material or because it's hard to yeah. test it on your parents or stuffed animals or something like that. <laughs> right. No, it's so funny. Like um, I've been trying to figure out ways to do that. And I think there's like kind of two ways I've been testing out Uh, one is like just Twitter like if you write jokes on Twitter people will respond if they're good jokes Um, but also like my podcast surprisingly has helped me a little bit too because uh, just the idea I ended up coming up with and kind of the format that I chose for the episodes was um, it like really lended itself to like short jokes and like you know, one yeah, I listened. Things. I listened. I laughed. Oh, I thank like, you. Appreciate I was like that. this. I was like, this is kind of relaxing and and funny. <laughs> Maybe this is like the kind of meditation that I actually need. Everything else, maybe. Yeah. Why does meditation? Why does it have to be like boring? Maybe I could like take my. That's I don't know. exactly how I feel. I'm just like I'm not, I don't have the patience. I'm just like too impatient for it. Like I can't do a regular, uh, just a t- a classic meditation exercise. But. um so yeah, that's honestly helped. And of course, it's very different. Like people can't react in real time to it. But, you know, people have told me like, oh, this, that bit where you talked about this one thing, that was funny. And like people can respond that way. So yeah. that's been, hopefully I can like use that material and like recycle it for stand up down the road. You're writing, you're writing and you're yeah. getting, you're getting, you're writing and you're getting enough feedback to, to, you know, to, to keep you. Mm-hmm. Keep that muscle, that muscle going. Same, at least. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, why don't we get into it? You, why don't we go way back into, you know, to the drive home from the hospital and tell me what you remember <laughs> <Hell> uh, <yeah. laughs> from from that. From that, sure. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so this house I'm in right now, my parents' house in D.C. is the house I've lived in for like most of my life. We had one other house when I was born that was like a mile away and then um, here now. So... Let's see. I grew up, grew up here, um, went to college in Philadelphia, which was honestly pretty much where I got started in comedy or at least got exposed to the possibility of it. And then, um, I graduated in 2018. So I pretty much moved to LA like right after, like (laughs) I was so done with school and so fed up with it that like, I think it was like a week after graduation. I like sprinted out, out to LA. Um, and I've been there since then, haven't really left. And yeah, that's when, so when I moved out to LA, that's when I started really grinding and getting into the scene. Um, started doing open mics. I was working just like a regular day job. And that was like, just like the beginning of it for me. Like that's when it kind of like clicked. I was like, this is great. And I feel like this is where I need to be. And this is like what I want to set my sights on. Yeah. But what about when you were like five years old? Like what, what did you have goals when you were five years old? Like what kind of kid were you? What were you into? Like in, oh, even man, in like elementary yeah. school or early memories that jump out at you. Sometimes they're I bad mean, ones. People tell me, but you don't, I, right. good ones are better. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, I was like really quiet as a kid and honestly, I still am quiet um especially compared to like most comedians um you want to overcome your fear out there you it's uh like for for you to conquer your no totally exactly um but yeah I had let's see I went to a French school which was you could say that's unusual but yeah so let's see I enrolled that was the first school I went to is this French private school in Bethesda Maryland Um, and yeah, my parents kind of just decided like, we want to raise our kids with like a second language (laughs) and that's kind of what turned out. So, um, I was there up until, um, 
like eighth grade and I'm trying to think like I wasn't are your parents French um so my dad's Middle Eastern he's from Syria so a lot of his relatives speak both Arabic and French gotcha uh and I think he recognized that Arabic was just like insanely hard to learn. So um, there was a French school nearby and they were like, let's just do that. So yeah, that's how, so me and my sister both, both speak it fluently. Um, it's, I've gotten pretty, wow. <laughs> I've gotten a little rusty since I left, but I can still, you know, hold a conversation. So it's a great skill to have. Do you speak Spanish at all? No, I, I took it for a bit in, I want to say, yeah, it was middle school. And then I think a little bit in high school, but I've totally forgotten that. I'm trying yeah, to pick up like I want to get back into it. Yeah. Oh, were you were you fluent at some point? No, I was never fluent, but I took it for a few years and I would remember mm-hmm. it would come back, I feel like, fairly quickly. Right. But conjugating all the verbs got hard. Oh my god. Yeah, that's well, so actually Spanish and French are so similar in that. Well, actually they're similar languages overall, but the verb stuff is like pretty much the same. Like it's just as complicated, like all the like you know, like different endings and like the gender stuff. Like it's really people hard. Say to Eng- and people say English is even like harder to learn. I, I've heard that it's objectively harder to learn. And I guess, you know, some of those other European languages. Yeah. yeah There's so many exceptions that. to every rule, I guess. There's so many exceptions to like every rule. Right. And then I'm trying, so I'm since quarantine and I have all this time, um, I am trying to learn Arabic now too. Cause as I mentioned, that's the other language my dad speaks. Um, and that's really hard for sure, but I'm not even attempting to learn how to like read, write, obviously, cause it's a whole other alphabet. Um, so I've been doing like, I found like, just like a language app on online and it's on my phone and I just do like 20 minutes of Arabic every day and we'll see where that goes. <laughs> how far are you along with it? Did you say? Um, let's see. I started in like... I started in like the summer at one point. Um, and yeah, I've, I do like 20 minutes a day. So, and so you've made, think, so you've made progress. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody, bit. so could I do this? I, so conceivably I could do something similar with Spanish. I could, re, I could get back into yeah. it and within a few, yeah. within a few months. I'd be like, damn, I'm getting good at this. I think so for sure. Like it's, it's worked really well for me. And like, there's all these apps that people really, really like to use. Um, so yeah, I can tell you which one I've used, uh, and it's, it's called mango. They have like, yeah, pretty much everything. And I got it because it was funny enough. It was the only app that had, uh, so Arabic's like pretty complicated cause they have all these dialects. I imagine. So yeah, like literally from North Africa all the way to, uh, like Syria, Palestine, that whole part. So, um, yeah, you, there's like all these different dialects and <clears throat> so many of these like websites and platforms like don't have half the dialects that, that like you would want to speak. They have like very kind of like textbooky standard ones that um, aren't used for regular conversation. They're used for like newspapers and like official documents, that kind of thing. Um, and then they might have like, I think the largest uh the largest group of Arabic speakers is uh, in Egypt. So like Egyptian Arabic is like a specific dialect. So they had like that one and a couple others, but I wanted to speak the kind that my dad speaks. So that's Syrian um, Arabic. And that's like way more, way less common. So I had to like really dig for it. And this was like the only app that had it pretty much. Which app was that? It's called Mango. And you have to pay, I think it's like $8 a month. But yeah, it was like the only one that I could find that had what I needed. So yeah, it works great. Do I want to get smarter for eight dollars a month? Right. It- <laughs> There's some free ones. There's some free ones. No, I know, but doesn't... no, but that never takes you as far as paying for it. You mm-hmm, get you mm-hmm. get what you pay for. You get what. Oh you yeah, pay like for. if you pay for it, you'll put more effort into using it, probably. Right. Yeah. And that, I have, yeah. Like that's the thing about a, that's the difference between a favor and a job. Even if you don't, I've heard this recently. Like. Even if no matter how much you pay someone, if you pay someone to do something for you versus them, like even if it's a friend doing a favor, when something yeah. becomes a job, it's taken more seriously and they'll give more effort and you'll, it's just a better, better scenario. Yeah, no, 
I think you're right about that for sure. Um, yeah, like I just, <clears throat> I just got a, I had like Invisalign when I was in high school. So those like invisible braces. And it was because like my, den my dentist told me I needed braces. And I was like, so pissed off that he told me this in high school. And I'm like, I'm never wearing, I'm not having like, it was like my junior year in high school. And so everyone, for the most part, people who had braces had already had them. And I was like, I'm not like going into like my senior year, um, like all brace face. Can I get Invisalign? So I did that. But um, obviously, because I was in school, my, my parents paid for it. And I like was so bad about wearing it. Like I was not disciplined at all. And, uh, and but so then just now I just got it again. And now that I'm paying for it, I'm so much better about it. Like I, it's not even a question. Is it, is it, is it painful, the Invisalign? Uh, no, it's just like you switch it out every week. It's a little tight when you put in the new ones, but that's about it. Cause I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it too. I don't know if I'm like eligible for it. Yeah, you should do it. And just like, I just went to like this orthodontic place in Culver city and they just like kind of gave me a quote and I was like, cool. <laughs> you can like consult with them and then decide if it's something you want. Yeah. Kind of I've gone down this whole like rabbit hole with like, um, dental stuff and just like research on stuff. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, I'm gonna have to talk more later about, about this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, because I'm very curious about the we can talk about the Invisalign stuff. But besides being a quiet kid and uh, someone who was learning French in Washington D.C., um, mm -hmm. what what else were you like into when you were a kid? Were you you know you hang out a lot with your sister? Were you into sports like music? Yeah, let's see. So I started out. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like my major hobbies because like throughout my childhood, they changed so much. Um, so I actually started, um, my parents enrolled me in ballet classes when I was like four, which I hated pretty much for the entire time that I was, I did it from like age four up until middle school. So it was like a really long time. Um, and I was like really good at ballet, but <laughs> I hated it so much because it was just like, I just didn't like the dance style and like, it's all about being like rigid and like disciplined and like, it's just very like, it's like the opposite of modern dance where people can kind of like just show up and like move their bodies in a creative way. And it's like, yeah, cool. That works. But ballet was like so rigid, but um, I did do that for a really long time. Um, and then eventually, how long, is how long is a long time? Let's see, like age four to like, end of middle school so I was like 12 so like that was more years. your parents pushing you into that or something or you kind of liked it yeah it was definitely my parents well it was mostly my mom um she just like loved the the art form and I think she yeah she loved kind of like the aspect of it that was all about like behavior and discipline and all that stuff yeah um so yeah me and my sister actually both did it and we both did it for like a really long time and I think like eighth grade was when she decided like okay maybe now is when you're old enough to like sort of make <laughs> your own decision on this if you don't want to continue doing it you you don't have to do it and so I like quit right away like in eighth grade and part of me kind of regrets it because like I was really so good part of me like a that's cool of your me. mom though that's cool of your mom mm -hmm. though to like uh you know not be like like fucking Andre Agassi's dad or some shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Tiger totally. Woods's dad, uh, one it's, of these crazy. Yeah, it's so Jackson funny. Jackson Five dad. I'll keep naming crazy yeah, dads. It's so funny you mentioned that Andre Agassi because perfect segue. So, um, my dad is really into tennis. Like that's his obsession, and he actually looks like Andre Agassi. People tease him all the time that they look very similar. What era um, Andre Agassi? Well, closer to now because he got fatter now because <laughs> he's, like, he's <laughs> he, no longer a professional. Does he, they look the same now. They've caught up they to each look, other. Now that he's chubby, like when he was thin and on the court, people were like, you guys have some similarities. But now that he's chubby, they're like, it's crazy how similar they look. Like it's actually kind of a spinning image. Like that could be his brother, no question. Um, and he's Algerian. So like he's partially Arab, kind of like my dad. Um, but yeah, so like my dad 
was really into tennis is still very, very into tennis. It's like his number one hobby. And like after my sister and I quit ballet, my dad was like, you guys should try tennis. So we did for a while. Um, My sister was a lot better than me. She was a lot more committed. She played up until like the end of high school. And she was like right in that middle range where she wasn't good enough to to like get in to get a college scholarship for tennis so she but she was like too good for like other things um so she didn't get into college for tennis but she still kind of plays I really petered out on tennis uh like mid high school um so it was ballet and then tennis And then, oh, right. And (laughs) this is so, it's so funny thinking back on all this because I've changed so much from like both of these eras. Um, In, I decided I didn't like tennis (laughs) in high school. And my parents were like, okay, well, you have to do something. You can't do nothing. So I was like, because I was just like an angry high schooler. I just wanted to like protest anything my father wanted. So I was like, fine, I'll do another sport. So I ended up doing cross country. (laughs) which is like ridiculous thinking back on that because I'm not athletic and also if I'm going to work out the last thing I ever want to do is run like just run a mile that's like my least favorite kind of workout so um I did cross country for like literally half a semester in high school so it was like ballet no um uh tennis no cross country no And then, yeah, it was my freshman year at a new school. And my mom was like, you need to do something. You can't just do nothing. Like, even though you didn't like that, you have to pick something else to do. I don't care what you do, but just pick a (laughs) hobby. (laughs) Like, literally just pick one thing. Um, And so that's when I completely did a 180 and I got really into theater. So I did high school theater um, pretty much the whole time I was there. I was in like... We did like a big musical production every year and then we did like smaller plays um, and yeah, that kind of became like my life. And it was like the first time I was like, I'm so pumped about this and I'm so like invested in it. Um, And so I really got into it and I'm still, I don't still do theater, but I still love theater and I love Broadway and all that. Was that the first time you'd, you'd ever performed like, uh, yeah. like in front of people in high school theater? Never, never had done anything singing, dancing in front of a, a fucking family well, barbecue the, or some shit or even? Pretty much. Well, so ba- I did do ballet in front of audiences, but... That's right. Yeah, yeah ballet. <clears throat> but it's so different. Like ballet is so just like buttoned up and like you don't really get like reactions from people. And also I wasn't doing like actual recitals that much. Like I was mainly just taking these like rigorous classes and then we had like you know a recital like once a year but uh yeah so the theater thing was like yeah totally it really felt like the first time where yeah I was like right in front of people in a way that I had like never experienced before I started out just like in the ensemble like with no major roles or whatever but I eventually got bigger and bigger parts and yeah, the theater scene at my high school was really, really fun because it's like fun when st- a lot of students are involved. And we had like these great, like when you have like student audiences, they're always like rowdier and more invested and more engaged. So yeah, I definitely feel like that opened up the kind of like avenue to, for me to eventually get into performing in the arts and stuff. Yeah, I don't regret not being involved in theater, but maybe I regret not going to the shows and just checking right. them out because I probably would have liked them because I like, I guess I like everything. I just like to be entertained. Like, uh-huh. you know, in any possible way, just just entertain me, I guess, you know. Right. Or inspire, yeah, no, educate great. or something, make me think like, get you know, if you can get a reaction or response or something like that. I yeah, guess. it's awesome. And they're pretty good about like, it felt like almost like a, yeah, it felt like almost like a performer's like boot camp in many ways because they're taking all these kids who have never performed before and putting them on stage and they just teach you like very basic things about being on stage that carry over to other other kinds of art and stuff, you know? So they taught you like always like have your face look really alert and always react to the people around you, even if you're not in the center of the stage. And 
like rehearse this amount of times with these people, you know, just like it was a good kind of like boot camp to get into into that. Probably helped you in your you know general life also. Like you were saying, you're like a quiet kid, and then you all all of a sudden you're in high school theater. Like it must have helped you, like yeah, socially Actually, or whatever. I would guess. Yeah, it's it's so great that you pointed that out because I don't think I ever really made that connection formally. But I think you're totally right. I think that kind of is what took me out of my shell because also, like, as I mentioned, this was like the first kind of hobby where I felt like, oh, I'm really into this and I really, really enjoy this. So I was just having like way more fun. And yeah, I I remember like when people, when my parents came to like my first show, like first theater show, they were like, we've never seen you like this. Like we didn't know that we had this in you to like bop around on the stage and you're like so like excited and you have so much energy or whatever and yeah I, I totally agree with you I think it like kind of brought me out of my shell a bit that's great and I'm sure other people yeah. recognize that in you too they probably saw like your parents and your sister did, did they I mean you said you're, they came to the shows did they they're you know they must have thought it was a good thing your mom must have been happy that's just like oh she's doing something yeah. now Oh my God. She was like, yeah, she was so excited. She took so many pictures the first show. Um, and like still to this day, she's like, I miss your high school theater productions. Oh, I also did. Cause with that, I also got into, once I found that like, that was kind of like my niche and that I like enjoyed performing and I enjoyed the art arts. I also did, uh, I did choir in high school too. So like after I got into the musical, I was like, Oh, well maybe I can do more. And then I started taking, um, like we had like a choir group at, at school. So I was doing, yeah, both theater and, and choir. Um, and yeah, that just like really helped me a lot. What about like watching TV and movies and stuff like that? Where you, and music, were you into like popular cult, you know? Like yeah, culture? I was, uh, well, my dad is like a huge, huge film head, just like kind of randomly. He, he like logs all the movies he watches. And he says that, like, since he started watching movies, he he's logged like over four thousand movies. Wow, watched, that's a which is that's a impressive. that's a buff. He's he's like a, he's a he's a, a the definition of a buff, but like a right a big buff, a huge buff. Yeah, and when you um, it's funny if you if you interrogate him about movies, anything before as anything especially like made before like nineteen ninety five, he's seen it. You know, like he's a little bit cloudier on like the newer movies because he doesn't go to the theater as much. But like if you talk, if you bring up pretty much any movie before like ni- the mid 90s, he's probably seen it, which is wow. pretty, pretty impressive. Um, so, yeah, so my dad was really into film. And yeah, that kind of I definitely had a phase in high school, I would definitely say, where one of my best friends in, in high school, my best friend, Hope she was she was a huge film head and she actually studied film in college and so i definitely went through a phase where i was like i was pirating so many movies like i think it was like a summer where i like had nothing to do i had no job and i was just like hanging out at home and i just i think i watched like a movie a night like i just got i was like well i'm home not much else to do and i was just like on like Quilt Locker and all these like sketchy websites. I just remember like watching movies, watching like really amazing. If you don't download it, it's okay. I know. (laughs) I stay in the browser. I remember watching these like really good classic movies on like, but with like horrible quality because I was like torrenting it or whatever. I would Um, never do such a thing. (laughs) Right. Smiling as you smiling as I say it. Yeah, smiling and winking. Um. So yeah, I that was uh. It's funny because like I I remember that kind of period in my life and I remember like the movies that really kind of stuck with me back then. And like sometimes so recently I've been, especially over quarantine, I've been like re-watching some of the ones that I watched in high school that I thought were like mind blowing or whatever to see how my taste has evolved. Um yeah, and I'd say like for the most part it's like kind of stayed the same. Um I think in high school, I was like, I gave so much credit to like anything that had like a cool aesthetic. Like if it looked like, if it looked like something you would see on Tumblr, I'm like, I'm obsessed with this. 
And I yeah. feel like now I'm like more about like actual story and stuff. But yeah, like my gut instincts from mo- liking movies at that during that time have, per- I would say, more or less stayed the same. What did you, uh, you know, think you'd be doing, you know, college wise or career wise or whatever the future, like junior, senior mm-hmm. year, high school, where were you like headed or whatever? Um, yeah. So like my senior year of high school, yeah, high school was so different from where I'm at now because I was like so high achieving in high school, like for no reason. Like I was just like so studious. I was so about like get into a great school and just like what? work really hard. Was it hard? Did you feel like you were working hard? Was it e- did academics come easy to you? Uh, yes and no. Like, you said you were good at something you hated earlier. Also, I know. Who do you think you are? <laughs> How dare I? Um, I was. Oh, I struggled with reading because, and this is something I didn't even realize until later. But I like beat myself up over it so much but then I realized that I started learning a language like I learned French when I was really young and I think because of being like fluent in that and using a lot of using that language to speak in school and everyday school life it made it a lot harder for me to be good at reading so I was like but it wasn't even bad I was just beating myself up over it so much because I was like pretty high achieving like I was like I took the, the first time I took the SAT and I like wasn't happy, happy with my reading score. And I like was so mean to myself about it. Um, so yeah, I was like pretty, just like really high achieving back then. And I, I was trying to think, I'm trying to think of like what my plan was senior year of high school. I don't Majors think I in knew. college or something, major in college or college or something like that. Yeah. So I don't think I knew like what I wanted to do with my life or what I wanted to study specifically. I just knew I wanted to be like, I was like, I just want to get into like the best school I can get into. I was like, so just like competitive for no reason. Um, So yeah, I got into, I went to school at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in Philly and I kind of showed up there like undecided major, undecided kind of everything. And I wasn't sure exactly where I was headed. And then I joined this. I was like, oh, I was like, I want to continue my, my like theater pursuits. Cause like, I love theater. I love, I did it in high school and it was so much fun. And so I was like, what theater groups can I join on campus? Oh, and I also cast a wide net. Cause I was like, I did choir. Maybe I should also join like a singing group, like an acapella group or something. So I was like looking at like acapella groups and uh, theater groups. And honestly, like they weren't just when I got into it and I like got to meet the people and I got to see what they were doing. They weren't like what I wanted and they just weren't as cool as I thought they would be. And they weren't they didn't seem as fun or cool as my high school theater group, which was like really unique and like really tight knit and like really just like diverse and, and great. So then I was like, oh, someone kind of like scouted me for um, this other group called Bloomers, which was an all-female sketch comedy group. So it was like all-female musical sketch comedy. And someone was like, "This because I remember telling someone like, I don't feel like I fit into any of these groups. And someone told me like, oh, well, there's this other group that you should check out. I feel like you would really, really like it. Um, and so I did, I went to like one of their shows, they were doing like a promotional show and I checked it out and I was like, whoa, this is where I need to be. Like it was, it seemed perfect. Cause it had like some musical elements, a lot of like theatrical elements cause it's all sketch. So it's very like, you know, like you're acting kind of thing. Um, and then, and then it had like this comedy element that I had never done before, but I was like, well, I'm, a, I'm like a performer. I can probably figure it out or like blend in or whatever um so I joined that group and like that's definitely what kind of changed my uh my trajectory and informed me about what I wanted to do and made me realize that like comedy is actually like a real a real pursuit and a real passion and also a real job that people had um So that really kind of did it for me. But when I joined, I was like so scared and I was so clueless about how everything worked. 
um, we did, so it's a sketch group, but we wrote all of our own original sketches. So I like sh- showed up to like our first rehearsal and they were like, oh, our first rehearsal isn't a rehearsal. We're going to be writing sketches as a group. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I was like, I didn't know that this would be like part of my responsibility. Like I was so unprepared for it. I was like, I'm just like a theater kid. Like, I don't know how, what? Like you're expecting me to write. Um, And it was like really, really hard for like the first couple months because they kind of just like throw you in and you're with other students, but like they've been in the group before you. So they know they have experience at least like writing with other people. And like, that was a huge learning curve. Like I had to, I had to figure that out. Like it took a year of me kind of like, I was fine at the performing part, but like when it came to writing, writing sketches with people, it took me like a full year to like really crack it and feel like at least a little bit comfortable with it. Um, but That's once cool, I though. like realized, That's... yeah, it was great. It really like opened a door for me. And once I, once I like got over the initial fear after like, yeah, I think it was like that first year I like, not only did I realize that I could do it or that I wasn't bad at it, I actually realized like, oh, this is like really fun and I'm really, really enjoying this. And there were people in the group who were like older than me and they were like, oh yeah, it's so fun. And in fact, (laughs) you can pursue this professionally. Like I'm about to graduate and I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to you know, whatever, work in TV, or I'm gonna, like, try stand up, or whatever it was, like, it really kind of, like, opened that door for me, so I feel like, if anything, that was definitely the moment that, um, really changed it for real, and really, like, cemented in my mind that I could, like, try to pursue comedy. That's awesome, and you, it just sounds like you were really inspired by just seeing that, like, first, like, performance, or in that first time you, like, saw that group do, kind of do its thing, you're like, you said, like, this is where I need to be, and it's yeah. it commend it's commendable on your part because like life is weird because like if you hadn't like put yourself out there to be like oh I want to go meet the choir people or connect try yeah. at least try to connect with the theater people in your your college you may not have found the the you know the the group the comedy group as quickly or ever I, who knows like just like one thing yeah. leads to another by like no, I think about that moment like all up. the time. Yeah, I'm always like, shit, like had I not like walked. No, it was literally, it was due to like that one person that I mentioned who was like, oh, if you're not liking these other groups, there's this one group that I think you would fit well into. And I like, and I took her advice and I was like, okay, cool, I'll check it out. And I'm, I always, I, I like often think about had I not taken her advice and just like made that one move to try that thing out, honestly highly doubt I'd be like out in LA like trying to do stand-up because that definitely like catalyzed that yeah maybe it would have been something else though maybe something else yeah you're probably right <laughs> and so tell me more it. yes tell me more about like the that group and like where where did you you go like you know creatively artistically from from there and the rest of your college experience and coming to mm-hmm. LA quickly after that like what yeah let me see so Put that piece that together <laughs> Yeah, so I was in this group and, oh, well, that was the other thing. So, like, I was in it for four years. I was in this group for, like, the entire time that I was at school. First year was really rough. Second year, I was like, oh, I can kind of do this. And, in fact, I'm actually, I feel like I'm sort of good at it. And then um, junior and senior year, I was like, so they do, like, elections, like how most groups do, where they they like choose someone to be like a director and a head writer and a chairperson and all this stuff to like run the group. And so I got to be head writer and director for a semester, which was pretty awesome to like take on that like leadership kind of role. But then as I mentioned, like, because it was like my junior and senior year, like everyone's thinking about what they're going to go do after graduation and like what kind of career they're going to go after and all that stuff. And I was like, I was unsure that like that would even be a possibility, but like these other people around me were saying like, Oh no, no, you should try to investigate like pursuing an actual career in comedy. Um, 
So like I kind of went along with them and they were doing like senior senior year, they were doing like, let's go out to LA for a little bit and like, you know, like set some meetings and like meet some people and like same thing with like, okay, like and now next week we can go to New York, that kind of thing. Um, so I started like really kind of like getting into the career aspect of it, like trying to figure out like, okay, this is a hobby, but like what can I do after graduation with this? Like what can I how can I make this happen? Um, and like, so yeah, like I actually lucked out, like I ended up a lot of my friends kind of in my class, in my class of the comedy group, all wanted to do something similar. So they were all kind of like, well, let's move out to LA together kind of thing. And I got pretty lucky because I ended up out in LA with like a group of like several really close college friends who um if they're not like comedians outright they're out here or out in LA doing some kind of artistic thing and so we're all kind of like in a similar um, together so I have a friend who's a musician I have friends who are writers I have friends who are like more into like representation like being managers agents kind of thing and we kind of all like moved out here around the same time and we had that support system and they're still that's they're awesome still there that's with great me. so yeah it, it was pretty again pretty lucky in that sense like i'm glad we had such a such a like rapport um and that we're all kind of like out in la trying to trying to make it happen so yeah i pretty much moved out there like as i said like right after graduation oh and i didn't have a job that was the other thing is like my school was like very pre professional it was like so corporate like everyone was doing like finance or consulting or you know going to law school or whatever um and yeah I like moved out to LA without a job and most people at my school had jobs and I like crashed on a couch for like the first month and then I eventually like got like a retail job and then after that I was working yeah, I was just working like day jobs. And that's when I kind of like started pursuing comedy. I was like, well, shit, now I'm out here. All this stuff is happening. Tried my first open mic. And that was kind of like the beginning of that, that path. Well, I actually, sorry, technically I did try comedy. I, I tried stand up late in college when we were in New York one of those times. And I did do a few open mics in New York. Um, so my first open mic wasn't in LA, but I didn't, I definitely didn't feel like I was getting into the comedy hustle, the full on stand up hustle until I, until I moved out to LA, which was, yeah, right after college. How did those pre LA uh, stand up, the, the few sets that you did, how did those go? <laughs> such a, it was such a wide range. Like, well, so I did a few sets on campus. Cause there were just like these student led like comedy events every now and ag every now and again. And because I was in this sketch group, like they would sometimes tap me. They were like, Oh, we need someone to like open the show with like some bits or some monologue or whatever. And so, and there are other open mics on campus. So I did, I did stand up like on campus a few times, like almost not very seriously, but I did so well because I feel like student audiences are just like pretty generous. And if they know you personally, they're like really rooting for you. So like, I think back to my sets from like the few sets that I did on campus and like, wow, I got, I got so many laughs for the shit that I said on stage. Like I kind of remember some of the jokes I told back then. And like, I knew had I taken those jokes to like an LA open mic or whatever, I would have gotten <laughs> destroyed because it was not funny. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so those went really well because students are very supportive. They all know yeah. you. They all love you. Gotcha, yeah. <laughs> um, and but then I did do a few in New York and that started to kind of like be an eye opener because, yeah, it's just like how in LA it's very hit or miss. It was kind of like did a few here and there oh why does the room suck why are these comics not paying attention all that stuff but it wasn't until LA that I really realized like how hard the process was um because what happened was I came out to LA 
And I did like, I want to say like five to 10 sets at open mics that were fine. Like I did, I did perfectly fine. And then once I started to like really get into it and really um, focus more on my material and like writing new jokes every, not every week, but you know, every so often to test them out, that was like when I really started like bombing (laughs) because it was like, I was, I don't know, my material was like less prepared. I was doing it more on the fly. And I just like, I was less, accustomed to like the state the stand-up kind of stage and so I think like after just those first initial times it kind of hit me like oh shit this is gonna be like way harder than I thought like I'm not gonna have I'm not gonna have good rooms all the time I'm not gonna have students like clapping and supporting me for every joke that I tell uh so yeah once I got to LA it was like okay now this is real and I need to like recalibrate how I'm thinking about this were you a fan of stand up stand up watching it growing up or or more so when you got into it or like what when? Um I was a fan of watching it. Uh I'm trying to think of the people cuz obviously like now like now that I'm doing comedy I'm I think I'm so much more tuned in to who I really really like. Um and I have a lot of like like kind of like personal preferences but like, yeah, when I was in high school, like, my parents loved John Mulaney, um, so we would watch him a lot, um, yeah, he's great, yeah, he was, like, honestly, before, like, he was, I would say he would be, he was kind of, like, the, the gateway into it, because, like, he's so, like, family friendly, friendly, and, like, everyone just loves him, so, yeah, I would watch him with my family, and it wasn't until, kind of, like, years later that I was, like, Oh, I can do that thing that we were watching a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. actually already had that exact that exact thought. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. It was a pretty because there was kind of a disconnect there. Like, it was a while between us kind of like watching those specials at home and then me actually going out to do it. So I feel like I first remember hearing John Mulaney on like Pandora, just like randomly coming on, like just like some yeah. couple of bits or something like that. And I don't remember it being like, you know, I'm putting up quotes, family uh, friendly or whatever that, but I think that's mm-hmm. a testament to, to him. That's like, I just remember that he made me laugh, you know, and he's right. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, he's just great. Cause yeah, I think there's just very few people who are actively turned off by him. Like, certain comics like even though they're like objectively very skilled and talented like some people are just kind of like well that that's not my cup of tea kind of thing but I feel like yeah John Mulaney was always just like when we would have relatives over and like whoever would come over to and that was on like they were always like yeah we like this guy <laughs> yeah so you're this is part of your parent your parents are having have an influence on you <laughs> a little <laughs> bit heading in with that you know they planted a little bit of a, a, a seed there. a little bit yeah but it's funny because it's like if if you told them back then like hey this special might be the part of the reason why your daughter will eventually pursue stand-up comedy they might be like oh is this what we want <laughs> kind of thing but yeah yeah that's but kind of my didn't... next question how do they yeah how do they react to you you know they knew in college you were kind of pretty hardcore into it and the LA talk and all that. But once you really started to get into stand up, like where they like, that's awesome. You're like, yeah, it's been, it's been a little hard. not going to lie. Cause like I said, like I was so just high achieving in high school for no reason. <laughs> and yeah, I went to like a good college and a very like good corp, like kind of like traditional, you know, corporate ladder kind of place. And yeah. So a lot of my friends from college, like went, got, high paying jobs right out the, right out the gate. And so, um, I think like, so now that I've been doing it for two years out in LA, now my parents are like more habituated to it. I think it's, it's the hardest at the very beginning when you first like announce it and you're like, Hey, this is something I want to do. Cause that's when they like freak out. Cause they're like, we were not expecting this. So I've kind of strategically like ease them into it I would say like um like so like when I first moved out to LA I got like a nine to five job uh so that they like 
And then I would just do stand up at night so that I could be like, hey guys, look, I'm still making money. Acting still, like a responsible like, adult. Yeah, I'm still like a normal person. I can get, you know, I can stay here. I can get promoted. I could grow into something else and make more money, you know, whatever. Um, so that was like for a little while. And like, as I was going on, like they follow me on like social media and stuff. So they were seeing like how many sets I was doing. And I think like once they noticed, it helped, it helped them come around once they noticed how hard I was actually working on stand-up. Whereas if I was just like, I'm going to be a stand-up and they don't know like where or what, like what's going to happen. It seems so kind of like intangible. And they're like, you know, like that's a harder pill to swallow. But once they saw that I was like really putting in the work, I think they saw like, oh, well, something could probably come out of this since she's like actively working on it pretty hard. Um, so yeah, it's like, I think with every kind of like year that like goes by, I like, I subtly make it more clear that this is kind of the only thing I want to do or one of the only things I want to do and put more focus on comedy as opposed to like my stupid day jobs that I have. And I just think like, it's that thing of like, the more you kind of just bring it up slowly and slowly and subtly, they'll just get more accustomed to it. So yeah, they weren't like, they weren't super pumped at the very beginning, but I kind of made it seem like, oh, it was just a hobby for a bit. And then I think now they have a little more of like, they at least know a little more about what's going on. So they're still nervous. I'm sure they're still like very nervous and like (laughs) probably a little concerned, but at least they know that like, I'm really into it and that I'll work hard on it. So. What about seeing you perform? Have they seen you perform? What do they think of your your act? And uh, they give you <laughs> feedback on your material? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually haven't seen you perform that much because like I started really going hard once I got to LA and because they live all the way over here in DC, like it, they don't come to LA that, that often. Um, and actually they were planning on coming so I used to have like my monthly show Gina's Jungle and uh they were like really excited to hear to like see it and they were like we want to see what this is all about and they actually had plans to come fly out this March to come watch it and then coronavirus happened so that was like the last oh man the last chance I don't know I'm trying to think of other times they've seen me do stand up technically yeah, when I was doing a, the couple times I did it in college because we had like some showcases or whatever and they live two hours away from Philly. So that was fine. But um, yeah, they haven't seen me do it for real in LA. And like, I don't I don't even consider myself being a, like becoming an actual working standup until I got out here to LA. So they haven't yet, but TBD. that day is going to come very soon. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm sure it'll I hope. be a little a little judgy, but that's it. <laughs> and what about your your goals in, in in comedy? Where do you see yourself? I mean, let's say things go back to. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe we shouldn't let. I shouldn't let say anything. I don't. Know, Jesus. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, what? Where? Ideally, where would you see yourself in three years, five years, ten years, or you know, mm-hmm. stand up wise um, or or otherwise? Yeah. So. It's funny, I was just listening to <clears throat> Tommy's episode because I feel like we kind of had similar answers. But I like kind of, I love stand up. I want to keep doing it forever if I can. But like, I'm kind of using stand up almost as a an entry point into other things, uh, mainly because it's really hard to make money doing stand up. Like, even if you're a professional, it's just like so hard to make a living, especially when you live in LA because there's no money like people don't pay to do sets in LA like that's it's just, it just doesn't happen and so the comics that work in LA if they're only doing stand up they're making their money by touring and like going to other states all the time and traveling like that is not really something i'm interested in that much so um what i would hope for is i would hope to do uh like stand up for now and i i want that to be my uh 
to get me exposure essentially. And I want that to like lead me to other opportunities. And ideally I would like to work in TV writing. So like, to me, like a perfect scenario would be like, I could write on a TV show and make most of my money from that work that job like Monday through Friday during the day. And then hopefully still have time to like do some sets after that. Um, And then, yeah, I mean, if I get to that point, ideally, like if it were like the dream, the dream scenario, I would love to be someone kind of like, kind of like how like Rami Youssef is like, he's, he's a stand up. He started out doing stand up that got him exposure and then he like wrote his own TV show and now he still does stand up, but he writes and stars in his own TV show, which is pretty dope. Um, that to me would be like the dream, you know, being able to do kind of all those things and just being creative in like those different, those different ways I think would be ideal. Well, are you writing right now or what? Yeah. So I wrote a pilot uh, earlier, like, beginning of quarantine that's done uh that's awesome and so, yeah so i'm just trying to like send it around to people and maybe something will come come from that um it's just frustrating because i can't i can't do the main thing that i've been doing to like promote myself and like to get ahead in this industry so i can't do stand up right now so it's kind of like i have to brainstorm other ways to keep my momentum going and just to keep me on the map, I guess. Um, we don't have to go too deep into it, but I wanted to ask, is it, is it um, strange or interesting or ideal even to write, uh, for, I'm assuming you're writing for yourself to perform in. What's, mm-hmm. what's, what's that, that like for you? Do you mean, do you mean like writing a like character you mean that, jokes? No, a oh, character okay. that, that you're going to play like writing. For, oh, you know, yeah. What's that yeah, like? That's- that's definitely a challenge. Um, I think that's probably the hardest part, honestly, because as comics, it's so easy to like just make fun of things or make fun of certain types of people. And so it's it's it was a lot easier to write all the supporting characters because like they're not like me. They're just like very silly, kind of like absurd types of people that I've created. And that that was easy. But yeah, you're totally right. Like coming up with the protagonist uh, was definitely the hardest part because you have to be kind of the most honest with yourself. Um, And you also have to like, you have to do so many things at once. It's like, you have to be true to yourself and you also have to set, give them like clear goals and motivations and you have to make sure they're consistent. It's just like a lot to pack into a few pages. Um, So yeah, that was that was a challenge for sure. And I, I would say if anything, I've been I've been sending this script around and um probably the number one note that I get is uh to just flesh out the protagonists a little more and make them a little more specific. It's just hard because like, you know, when you know yourself, you're like, I know all these different aspects and facets about myself, but it you can't really you can't really tackle all of those at once you almost have to pick like like a like a quirk or like a bit or a certain thing that like your character does and like I'm trying to figure out like what's the kind of major thing that I want to lead this person um and that's yeah that's hard you just got to keep like revising it and getting people to give you feedback and I hear you I I'm kind of going through something a little (laughs) a little similar writing some things myself so I I I think I, I get it. And those are, that's some of the, not only do I feel like I get it, I like some of that stuff is good for good, probably good for me to hear too. Like it's like reminders. Right. It's like helpful. helpful yeah, no, totally. Reminders. It was it's definitely a good writing exercise. It helps you kind of like think out of the box and also be super honest with yourself. Have, uh, have you ever seen John Mulaney live? No, I'm so mad that I haven't. Um, I know most of my friends have seen him like multiple times. Like I have, I know people who've seen him at like the comedy store. And then I know people who've gotten tickets to his like tours and they saw him at like radio city, that kind of thing. Um, I would love to, but 
someday. <laughs> does he know? Does he normally live in LA? I guess you. I don't know if you know the answer to that question, but is no, he, I one hundred percent know the answer to that. Yeah, he's he's based in New York. This I know because funny, like my friends who live in New York see him like fairly often, just like on the street. Like I've seen like Instagram stories of people like there's John Mulaney and his dog, but um. Like, yeah, so I think he has a house in LA, like, and he comes out here every so often because, yeah. you know, he's got shit to do in LA. My, my hero. Yeah, my, totally. my bi coastal hero. <laughs> exactly. He can for, for play sure. both. Wow, I think we I think we covered a lot. I think I think we 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 did it. Unless there's anything else you want to mention, any any stories that we're forgetting about? Mom, dad, French, Arabic, John John <laughs> Mulaney. <laughs> suffering through not being on stage but continuing to to write i'll let you uh do your thing give you the floor and you can plug or promote whatever you're working on and social media and all yeah. that other oh yeah no that sounds like a great plan um so you can find me on social media at juicy gina that's j-u-i-c-y-g-e-n-a um and so twitter instagram you'll follow me there and then Whoever's listening, if you want to check out my podcast, I would love that. My podcast is called Insomnia Hour, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anything. And then hopefully, when the world comes goes back to normal, I'll have my monthly show again. My monthly show is Gina's Jungle, and it's in LA, usually the last Saturday. So, and that's my Cool. Thank you again for your for your time. I appreciate it. Good good yeah, stuff. Yeah, of course. Good, no, good this stories. is a lot of fun. Thanks Thank for you. interviewing me. I hope you got like a I hope you were able to get like a cohesive kind of like narrative. <laughs> no, I well it's not in order, but I think I got all the pieces. I, you, you got know, all the we, pieces. Okay, cool. You know, we started at the end and then we worked our way back to the beginning and then made it back to the It's all it's all in my head. I got the whole okay, narrative. So, here. Yeah, you got it. You got it. No, all I right, really cool. kind of you know, I was gonna say it's really kind of it's kind of interesting that you, you you bring that up because I when I'm like writing descriptions for episodes, I'm thinking to mm-hmm. myself, what is I'm really asking myself, what is this person's story? Kind of in right? a sense, I'm, yeah. I am sort of asking myself that. Sometimes it's just writing a few facts and highlights and jokes mm-hmm. in the description, but other times, you know, for the most part, I'm trying to think, what is this person's story? I don't want to like misrepresent right. anyone either. And it's, so it's honestly like kind of a challenge, like as you mentioned, like it's kind of like a good exercise to like step back and like just go through like all, all the major kind of milestones in your life and kind of like what got you to where you are. Like, I feel like I don't like think about that stuff too often. So it was nice to do that kind of experiment and just like see how it all fits in. So. For sure. But again, thank you. I appreciate it. I know you're on the yeah, East coast. So you're, 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 <laughs> you're, you're, you're ahead of me. It's all good. It was, perfectly convenient but yeah it was great talking to you oh you got it take care all right you take care adam so there you have it my conversation with gina b jones that was fun and again i really appreciate gina's time and definitely look forward to seeing her back on stage uh at some point uh for sure and no i haven't started diving back into spanish yet Anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's uh, at peoplewelovepodcast on Instagram as well. And I am at Adam and Troy on Instagram and Twitter if you want to follow me too. And I think that's about all I got for today. I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks as always. And uh, let's talk soon. Peace. Peace.